Namaste. So taking up where we left off last time, here are three verses quoted by the Upanishad from the Vedas. Regarding this, there are the following verses. The infinite, the radiant infinite being, Purusha, who moves alone, puts the body aside in the dream state and himself awake and taking the shining functions of the organs with him, watches those that are asleep. Again, he comes to the waking state. The radiant infinite being who is immortal and moves alone, preserves the unclean nest of a body with the help of the vital force and roams out of the nest. Himself immortal, he goes wherever he likes. In the dream world, the shining one, attaining higher and lower states, puts forth innumerable forms. He seems to be enjoying himself in the company of women, or laughing, or even seeing frightful things. So the important concept in these three verses is that it confirms the conclusion of the previous verse and purport that he, the shining being, the one who moves alone, is the agent in Svapna and Jagrat consciousness. He appears to be the doer, the knower, the desirer, the thinker, the speaker, and so forth. He appears to do all these actions as intelligence. And then because intelligence is always awake, the other organs, beginning with the mind, eyes, ears, and so forth, follow the intelligence. And if we examine our experience, <laughs> we see that this is true. Huh? Uh, as in the quoted verse previously, uh, verse 11, he moves as it were and shakes as it were. So in other words, it's not really action. It's not really knowing, thinking, saying, doing, and all of this. Actually, nothing is happening. <laughs> Nothing is happening. The self is simply a watcher. All the doing is done by the intelligence. And the intelligence is part of the natural world, part of the creation. So in other words, it's not us. It's not the self. It's an organ created by nature and because it's created by nature, that means it really has nothing to do with us. It's maya. It's illusion. Yes, it seems to be doing all these wonderful things. And that's the key word, seems. You know, when, when the Vedas or when the Upanishads use the word iti, means as it were, in other words, it seems to be happening, but that's not what's really happening. <laughs> it's not really happening at all. Actually, nothing really happens. But Maya creates the universe in one piece from start to finish, from the beginning to the end of time. It's one single seamless creation. It's not like you know, Maya and all the demigods and whatever are out there with picks and shovels <laughs> creating the next moment and the next moment. And the, no, 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 no. It's done. It's done from the beginning in one act. Boom. The whole thing. And then because we accept an embodiment in this creation, we are moved 
through time. Because without time, you, you can't have action. You can't have change. You can't have doing. You can't have agency. You can't have any of the things that we identify with and call ourselves. But that's self with a small s. <laughs> self with a capital S, the real self, Brahman, doesn't do anything doesn't change, doesn't move, doesn't think, act, speak, or whatever. And it certainly doesn't create karma and experience the results of karma. In other words, it doesn't work. And it's not subject to cause and effect. So what is the self then? The self is pure awareness. That's it. We're just along for the ride. We're like sitting back in the movie theater, eating popcorn and watching the show on the big screen. <laughs> I mean, isn't this funny? Isn't this hilarious? That when we go to a movie, you know, we tend to identify with one or more of the characters up there on the big screen, you know, the big hero or heroine or the, you know, whatever the story is about, you know, we tend to identify. And we walk out of the movie theater feeling a little bit stronger and more confident or whatever, you know, whatever the effect that the movie is designed to have on us. And the same thing goes on in life. We, the self, identify with the show, the intelligence, the mind, the body, the sense organs, the actions, the karma, the whole thing. But this is something that was made a long time ago and it really has nothing to do with us. So when we start to hear the teachings of Advaita, I mean, the, the actual teachings, not the phony commercial Neo-Advaita stuff, but the real thing straight from the source in the Upanishads. And we contemplate this. See, this is called Nididhyasa. That means the contemplation or the implementation of the teaching. Now, where does this come into our personal practice? Because it's very important that we own this teaching, that we make it who we are, that we identify with it. That's how we get the results. <laughs> I was looking around on YouTube, just, just for the heck of it, you know, which I do maybe, I don't know, once a year to see if there's anybody else out there, you know, teaching this stuff. And I did find one very interesting source. And he is presenting from the Upanishads in Sanskrit with English commentary, and it's very accurate and authorized. And I would give him an A minus, 90%. Why? because he teaches it as something separate from himself. He doesn't own it. He doesn't come across as somebody who is living this, but rather like a, a university professor teaching physics or something, you know, putting the slides up on the board. <laughs> <laughs> or with the drawings or whatever, and talking about it as something different from him, who he is, what he is. And, you know, from the very beginning of this channel, you can go back to the very earliest videos, and we talk about the integrity of speaking the truth about who we are and what we see. In other words, we don't present 
these topics as an academic subject matter to study, uh, as if it, you were cramming for an exam or something. <laughs> I mean, there will be a final exam. It's called death. But you see, that's a whole different story. That's a whole different mood from someone who is just like going through a school to get some kind of designation. You know? Oh, yeah, boom, stamp, rubber stamp. Now you're Swami so-and-so. Huh? Put on orange cloth. <laughs> yeah. See, we don't really need those designations. Although for some people, I suppose they're motivating. They help them, you know, do the work because there's some tangible goal to shoot for. Well, how about the tangible goal of self-realization? <laughs> but you see, self-realization is not obvious or doesn't change the world or the way people look at you or anything, you know? It's, it's not like everybody has a little sign on their foreheads. <laughs> self-realized, beep, beep. <laughs> No, it doesn't change anything. In this connection, I love to tell the story of my first major enlightenment experience where Shakti, Devi, came and directly gave me Shakti pot with her own finger. And then I saw everything. I saw the world in Brahman. I saw Brahman in the world. I mean, what else is there to see, right? That's it. And I felt this incredible bliss that is with me even now. So, see, what is this? This is owning the teaching. This is realization. This is making it yours. But it doesn't change anything. You know, I'm just a very ordinary looking guy. <laughs> There's nothing extraordinary about me. And because I'm humble, I don't have a big ego. You know, people don't really notice me. I can walk in and out of a room and nobody even really knows I'm there. Unless they know me, you know, or something. But in public, I don't show up like somebody, you know, uh, I don't have a big crowd of followers. I don't have any students. I don't have a temple or ashram or stuff. I mean, I could have all of these things, but I don't want them. I'm fine just being myself. And myself is Brahman. So if people are in denial about Brahman, they're going to be in denial about me. Isn't it? And almost everybody is in denial about Brahman, about who they really are and who everybody else really is. So after I had this wonderful realization, after, I don't know, five or six hours of this incredible bliss, I say, I, I have a doubt. Mind is always full of doubts, isn't it? So my mind was saying, uh, maybe this is just, you know, a flashback <laughs> to some, you know, LSD trip you had years ago. Uh, actually, I did have my first glimpse of Brahman in an LSD trip. Um, 1967, 1968, something like that. Yeah, like, welcome to San Francisco. Um, but that's like... Very long ago, I hadn't used any drugs in, I don't know, years, which is amazing because, you know, when I was a professional musician and such, I used to smoke grass every day. That's just normal. <laughs> but anyway, at that time, I was deep in sadhana, doing a lot of meditation and absolutely stone cold sober. But still, I had this doubt. Maybe the mind is fooling you. Maybe the, uh, you know, flashback or whatever it is, is just something temporary and it'll soon pass. 
Well, why don't you go see if your presence is any different? So I went down to a local tea shop and I was waiting in line to get tea. And nobody noticed me at all. I mean, even less than normal. <laughs> so after a while, I decided I'm really going to test this. I'm really going to find out if I am invisible to these people. So I got out of the line, walked up to the front of the line, made myself a cup of tea, <laughs> put sugar or what honey or whatever it was in it, and walked out the door without paying. Nobody even noticed, as far as I could tell. You know, it's not like somebody came running out the door. Hey, mister, you forgot to pay. <laughs> Nobody said a word. Nobody even reacted. Zero. Zilch. And I tried a couple of other similar experiments. And like, it was like I was invisible. The invisible man. <laughs> but that only shows that people are completely unaware or even afraid of those heavy bliss vibes and the presence of Brahman in an unconditioned state of consciousness. So to get back to this fellow that we're discussing, he's teaching, I mean, he's teaching the right thing. He's saying the right words. He's representing Shankaracharya and the Upanishads accurately, as far as I can tell. But what is missing is the personal experience. How did this happen to you? How did you feel about it, especially? You know, how did you take it? when you got the enlightenment experience or what it was your enlightenment experience. Impossible to tell because he doesn't reveal anything personal. So this is what I mean about owning the teaching. It's like if you really got it, it would change something, at least for you, if not for other people, <laughs> they don't even really notice, you know. And, uh, you know, like my girlfriend at the time, I was in a pretty serious relationship. But when I decided to just sit and meditate for like three or four weeks straight, uh, suddenly she had to go visit a sick friend. <laughs> I knew what was going on. I didn't care. My focus was, let me get this meditation because it was interesting more interesting than my girlfriend. Sorry, babe. It was interesting, fascinating, as Spock would say, to see what was unfolding in my mind with lots and lots of deep meditation. And then, of course, when the realization came, it happened spontaneously. Not like I was desiring it, you know? Oh, Give me realization. Oh, give me liberation. Please, please, pretty, please. Come on. That's baby stuff. If you really get this teaching, you can understand that what attracts the realization, what attracts the enlightenment experience is your state of purity. Yeah, everybody's a mamuksha. Everybody on this path wants liberation. Okay, okay, we get that. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be watching this. You wouldn't be doing any meditation or studying anything if you didn't want something out of it. Huh? Okay. So you want liberation. We got that. That's clear. Now what? And don't you think <laughs> that goddess is also very clear about that we want liberation? Of course she is. That's why she plunked us down in this body. Because 
In the human body on planet Earth, the vision of Brahman is the clearest. Believe it or not, uh, this is mentioned in the uh, Kata Upanishad at the very end, the fourth chapter, that even in heaven, in Svarga, the vision is, is kind of indistinct and kind of muddy and not clear. Only if you can go all the way to Brahma Loka, then you can see clearly. But that's very difficult. Takes all kinds of special work and so on. But we, anyone here on earth, can realize Brahman because the vision of Brahman is so distinct, so clearly different from matter, that when we do get a little glimpse of it, it's very obvious, it's immediately apparent. See, these are experiences. And we resolved, I was starting to say back in the beginning of this channel, that we would teach from our experience or not teach, but rather share our experience. Anybody can read the books, although very few people do. <laughs> They'd rather watch a video of me clowning around <laughs> talking about my experience. That's always been so funny for, to me because obviously I'm not giving the complete teaching. I can't in a video because an important part of the teaching, when you approach a master or a guru or a teacher, is the teacher's energy, the vibes. Huh? There's a wonderful story about this, about Zen swordsmanship. Zen swordsmanship is a very, I mean, <laughs> specifically peculiar art. Why? Well, listen to the story and you'll see. So the student goes to the master and he says, please teach me the sword. Master says, all right, put your stuff over there. <laughs> That's your room. <laughs> now you have to do whatever I tell you to. So he became like a servant and he lived with the master, he lived in the master's house. And he was cooking and cleaning and doing stuff and this and that, whatever the master told him to do. By the way, this is a real disciple. This is what a real disciple does. He comes to the master, the teacher, the guru, and just surrenders and says, you know, okay, tell me what to do. So he was living like this for a long time. And finally he said to the master, well, aren't you going to teach me? Master said, just wait, you'll see. So a few days later, he was cooking or something, you know, doing something. And the master sneaks up behind him with a bamboo stick and whap! <laughs> ah! Right? <laughs> the guy nearly jumps into the fire. What are you doing? And the master said, well, you asked me to teach you. And he said, well, I don't understand. What, this is teaching? He said, yes. First lesson in swordsmanship is do not get hit by the opponent's sword. Duh. Who would have thunk it? Right? When you think of learning the sword, you think of all these complicated katanas and all this, you know, doing, moving action. But no, this is the complete opposite. He's saying the first point is don't get hit. Right? Because how can you do all your fancy sword work if you're lying on the, on the ground bleeding out? See? So the first point is, don't get hit by the stick. 
And so this became their life. He, would, he had a regular schedule of duties to complete, and he was going through them every day, right? And every day, at some point or other, when he was distracted, when he was, you know, falling asleep in his work, in the routine, the mindless routine, right, of the quiet mind, the master would sneak up at him. Whap! <laughs> After a couple of years of this, the student became so alert. Huh? His quiet mind, instead of being focused on the work he was doing, was focused on the work that the master was doing around him. You know, and if things got too quiet, he became extremely alert. Huh? Anybody who's a parent knows that <laughs> when things get too quiet, that's when you really have to check up, right? And expecting that the master would try to, you know, sneak up on him, he'd be extra super alert. So he got to the point, he actually developed the power, the siddhi, that you could not sneak up on him, even when he was asleep. See, and he would learn, he learned how to jump out of the way and get away from the master's stick. Huh? You know, he's probably covered with bruises. <laughs> That's how you learn. See? It's an experience. It's not a theory. It's not a doctrine, not a philosophy, not a religion. See, it's none of those things. So this, this is what is so damned annoying about the, uh, the uh, Neo-Adwaitans, that the Neo-Adwaitans teach their philosophy as a religion. Either you're with us or you're against us. See, I lived in Tiruvannamalai, the home of Ramana Maharshi and Raman Ashrama, for five years. And I could not make any friends. Why? I was probably on some blacklist. And how did I get there? I thought for myself and I gave my own opinion in my videos. And you can go back at, at, and look at some of the video series I did on Ramana Maharshi, where I talk about my experience. Now, the, the Ramana Ashram folks were so put off by this that nobody would be my friend. I would invite people even for lunch, and they wouldn't show up. They went, it was horrible. But see, this is what happens in all organizations. All organizations have a boundary, a wall, between the innies and the outies, <laughs> the members and the non-members, the believers and the non-believers, or whatever, however they express it. Like when I was in ISKCON, we were the devotees. Everybody else was the karmis. <laughs> they were just interested in material work and their results. Karmis. Well, we were the bhaktas. We were the, the chosen ones. <laughs> and similarly, the neo Adwaitans have their little, you know, their little tight social groups. And either you're an innie or an outie. Either you're one of the dudes or you're on the outs, baby. And that's what I experienced. And that's what is going on in so many groups. Somebody's at the door. I'm busy. And when a person is on the outs like that, they don't get recognition. They don't get companionship. They don't get any of the benefits of being in the group. See, so this is what happens when you teach according to doctrine, dogma. Religion, philosophy, there's always a boundary between who's in and who's out. 
who's wearing the Swami clothes and who's wearing the regular clothes. See, who is an approved teacher and who is not? Who has got the authorized thoughts and who is thinking the unauthorized thoughts? It's always a problem with all organizations. Even the best and, you know, best intentioned organization is going to have some line between the true believers and the non-believers. So what can I say, you know? I would like to be viewed as who and what I am. I uh, don't like it when people project stuff on me that has to do with their own ontological constraints. See, that's an ontological constraint. When you say, I am in this group and others are out of this group. Well, what the heck makes the difference? It's just a thought. It's just a designation. It's just a name, just a material idea. And it's not you. It's part of your mind and it's part of your social circle. And all this maya uh, that is impermanent, imperfect, and not self. So we don't want that. We want that which is permanent and pleasurable and the self, Brahman. And so we talk about the experiences leading up to that realization to give you an idea of like where you're at and what is happening. Uh, because it's not enough simply to have access to the materials. You have to know how to work with them. Huh? I mean, you can have like a, a whole garage with a lift and a whole rack of tools and everything. But when somebody brings you their broken car, if you don't know how to work it, you can't fix it. So the same thing with consciousness. You can have a whole library, and we see in some of these guys' uh, videos, uh, a whole library full of all kinds of books, right? I guess it's meant to impress the viewer that, oh, I have so many books. I know so much knowledge. But to me, that says two things. Number one, I am trapped and limited by my knowledge. I'm carrying this heavy load of information with me, all these designations and explanations and doctrines and philosophies. And see, it's, it's hard work, but somebody has to do it. <laughs> no, no. And the other thing it tells me is that he's confused. Why is he confused? He's taking knowledge from here and there and, uh, you know, everywhere. See, as an artist, as a creative person, I know constraints are good for you. For example, if somebody came to me and said, write me a piece of music and I'll give you $100 <laughs> or whatever. He doesn't give any constraints. He doesn't give any guidelines. That is an impossible job. You cannot please anybody by that kind of direction because whatever you write could be right or wrong. You have no idea. But if somebody says, write me a three and a half minute piece to accompany this dance, Huh? or these photos, drone shots flying through the forest or whatever. See, that gives a very specific constraint. And so with those constraints, it's possible then to compose a piece of music exactly appropriate to those constraints. So the same thing goes with learning any body of knowledge. You have to, after surveying the whole field and seeing what is available, then at some point you have to constrain 
your efforts to one teacher or one source or one particular body or flavor of that field, body of work or flavor of a point of view on that particular field, and then go deep in it until you get the result. Only then will you be able to back off and look at the whole field and see which is more valuable, which is less valuable, and so on. Not based on whether they agree with your ideas, because ideas are only a means to an end, but whether their ideas actually nourish getting the result, getting the self-realization. So when I evaluate someone, someone's work and I say, well, it's 90% uh, because they don't seem to own or they don't share their personal experiences with that work, it's because I have found by my experience that really the personal experience is the thing. You know, it is the work. The ideas are only the creative constraints that allow you to concentrate your energy enough to reach the result. And so that's not sectarianism. That's not exclusivism. That's not groupthink. I'll give you another musical example. I love music. I want to learn all about music. So do I take like a dozen musical instruments and start trying to learn all of them? Obviously, that's not going to work. Yeah, maybe you try a few different instruments and see which one you like. Then when you want to make your decision about which instrument you're going to learn, you have some background, you have some experience, huh? and you know by listening to recordings and so on how it sounds. So, all right, you pick your instrument. In my case, it was the flute. And I practiced like 10 to 12 hours a day, you know, in my early life, and I got really good at it. <clears throat> and then, after my senior year in high school, I went to music camp. And we used to have these things called happenings. And in a happening, the whole idea is you don't play your instrument, the instrument that you specialized in. We would actually literally trade instruments with each other. <laughs> So sometimes I found myself playing bassoon or trumpet or piano or upright bass or, you know, just whatever. And this was so interesting because given the experience I had learning the flute over 10 or 12 years of practice, I could pick up another instrument like that and actually produce music with it that blended with the whole ensemble, which was the point. The point is not what you play, but how you play together. And so in the same way, this knowledge that is being given by the Upanishads, it's not about, you know, how to be a good church member or how to be a dues paying cult member or whatever, you know, it's about how to get the realization. So if you can get to the realization, have the experience and understand it, hold it in the right way, uh, you will know then about the efficacy of all other similar paths because you have gone through the experiences and you own those experiences. They're yours. The path or the doctrine or the teaching or the scripture is not something separate outside of you, but you have realized it. Your being has become the thing. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung. Aung Namah Shivaya.